sing to the spirit. Moves in my heart, I'm gonna sing to the spirit. Moves in my heart, I'm gonna sing to Jesus Christ. I'm gonna sing to the spirit. Moves in my heart, I'm gonna sing to the spirit. Moves in my heart, I'm gonna sing to the spirit. Moves in my heart, I'm gonna sing to Jesus The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. The Lord is, beloved, we're so happy to see all of you here together, gathered in worship. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we're grateful for this time together, for this time of worship, for this time of prayer and praise, hearing your word and your will for us. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of coming together in this way, to be in this, your house. We ask, Lord, that you would touch us, each and every one of us, that you would let us know that you're here, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and guide us into our new life together. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship, for the sacrifices that have been made for us and for our sakes. Be with us now as we worship in a mighty way. These and all other blessings we ask in the precious name of Jesus and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Beloved, would you stand and sing with me our opening hymn number 305, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing.
First Church. Please join me in the reading of the litany, which is found on page three of your bulletin. O God, because of the faithful witness of your people down through the generations, the story of your gracious love and its sovereign power has been given to us. We are gathered here together because we have heard the call to follow Jesus. For when we look into ourselves and back on our past, we sometimes are overwhelmed by the failure and weakness we find. And we are gripped by fear and doubt. Yes, if we journeyed alone under our own strength, certainly the wilderness would swallow us. But we would choose our way instead of being led by God to the way of life. Where God is present with God's people, their mercy, kindness, love, and understanding flow like new wine. Lord, cast out our fears so that our hearts may be open to your love and to one another. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let us pray. Most merciful Father, on this day and in all days, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon us. As you have always been generous with us, teach us to be more generous with each other, not only with our treasures, but our time and our talents. Expand and multiply these gifts that we bring today that they might make a difference, a true difference in this place and in this world. These and all other blessings we ask in the precious name of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. to prepare yourselves for the power and the potential of prayer. We know that the Lord hears our prayers and the Lord speaks to us. We know that we all pray in different ways. Some of us pray, some of us pray with words, some of us pray with a sigh, some of us pray in silence, but however we lift up our prayers, I believe the Lord answers our prayers. I want to ask you, whatever your situation is, to pray not only for yourselves, but I want you to pray for your neighbors and for your strangers. I want you to pray for members of our church like Becky and Gary Spencer, who lost their aunt. Becky was the caretaker of her aunt for quite some time, so this is a significant transition that they are making. So pray for them. That's why they're not here today. I want you to pray for the family of the great saxophonist and musician, Jimmy Heath. You all know that Jimmy Heath died this week, and Jimmy had moved from New York down here to Atlanta. And it's a great loss because he's one of the great jazz giants who mentored generations of great musicians. We have so many things to pray about, not only in terms of worry and trouble, but of praise and triumph. Remember that every good blessing you receive comes but from the Lord, and that God's grace is sufficient. Center yourselves now. Get quiet. Get still. Don't worry about the words. God will hear your prayers. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that as we try to live into the faith that we testify to, that we might be able to say with our hearts and with our minds, with our entire being, that it is indeed well with our souls. Lord, to be able to say it is well, even in the midst of great strife, sometimes in the midst of hurt and pain, can be hard, but that's why you've given us this powerful tool called faith. It gives us the capacity to say God is good in every circumstance. That God has provided a way out of no way. That God knows even when we don't know. And because God loves us so completely, so thoroughly, so unendingly, all we can say is, it is well. It is well with my soul. Lord, in this very hour when our world seems to be upended by grief and by strife and by greed, and by avarice, help us to remember that you are still on the throne. And that even in the midst of this momentary struggle, we know who the victor is. We are victors through Jesus Christ who lived and died and was resurrected for our sakes. Lord, we pray not only for ourselves, but we pray for those who don't know of you. 
Because, Lord, my soul looks back and wonders, how could anybody live in this world of craziness without knowing that there is a higher power, higher than all worldly powers, higher than man, that there is but one truth, truth in God, truth in you. We pray, Lord, that those that are seeking might find you. We pray, Lord, that those that have found you might continue to proclaim and praise your name. We pray, Lord, that you might use us to be your hands and feet in this world that needs us so desperately. So, Lord, in these few still quiet moments, allow us to be grateful for this very circumstance, even for this moment of prayer for the smiles, for the embrace, even for the quiet stillness that you give us. And Lord, we pray for peace in our hearts that allows us to deal with all of the momentary upsets of our lives, knowing that there's always something larger, something bigger, something more important, something more beautiful than we could ask for or even imagine. Lord, hear our prayers for ourselves and for those who need praying over. And keep us mindful of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us out to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. I will read from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, um, chapter 55. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread? And you labor for that which does not satisfy. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make you an everlasting covenant. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, make it bring forth and sprout, and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, 
but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord a memorial, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right. And from the New Testament, I will read from Mark. Chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. For there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered the house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed, and the demon had gone. The word of God for the people of God.
requires such a high bar. One I intend to clear requires such a high bar. Pastor, it was uh, very, very good news to tune in online from D.C. last week and see you in the pulpit, hear your voice spoken once more here. Uh, it lets me know all is well, all is well. I've also heard other voices this week, uh, one of which uh, seems to keep refraining and refraining. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. <laughs> and I wonder if that applies here, Reverend Dr. Andrews. You said you were going to preach briefly last week. I wonder if there's an accumulation of time here in this pulpit for me to take care of this morning. Get you back to even. I won't tarry too long in a more uh, staid church in a, in a white Protestant congregation, I'd have a total of four minutes. <laughs> and that includes the benediction, so I might go a little longer than that. It's good to be together. I'm grateful for those who travel. Every minister is grateful that for those who travel with him near and far, whether you're a pastor uh, or a nonprofit director or a professor, anywhere in between. So I'm grateful for uh, friends that are here this morning. And even my beloved mama, who I think is tuning in in Calcutta, India, uh, in uh, her nighttime, our daytime. Uh, glad to see her. It's remarkable, this family that I've married into. I took mama to Chautauqua Institution this summer for the first time, a place that I've been working for uh, well over a decade, going on two now. And was so excited to take her to Chautauqua and introduce her to folks. And I had a grand surprise for her, my wife's mother, the National Poet Laureate, just named Joy Harjo, the first uh, Native American Poet Laureate in our country, was to be there. And Mama holds a master's degree in English literature from Calcutta University. And so I thought, what a better moment than to pull together some time from Joy Harjo with Mama, just a private moment for them. And so I did. I was able to arrange that, um, and uh, they go up on the veranda of uh, the alumni house on these hallowed uh, grounds, and I give them a moment, and uh, the conversation just picks right up, it's surprisingly so, and they are going on, and Joy has to be at another funder's appointment, and so after about 10 minutes, I go over to break it up and see what they're see what they're talking about, and Mama says, oh yes, Joy, we were together 15 years ago in Calcutta. <laughs> <laughs> Such is the beloved family that I've married into. I'm grateful for my partner to be here, full of surprises. Uh, what a better gift in the world than to marry well into a, a family that loves you. Amen? Amen. 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 The primary text this morning there are two, as it is our tradition to have both a New Testament and an Old Testament reading, and, and both can take us down a path uh, to this place about proximity, where proximity matters, proximity is crucial, where, where our location has everything to do with what comes next, who we will be how we will respond to the world around us, both, both the world we've created and the one we find ourselves in. Those two things so intertwined, we're not sure where one starts and the other begins, but, but it is our place in that moment. We could go down both paths or either path, I think, this morning. I want to take us down that ancient prophet's path and Leave the other for your contemplation this week. Uh, that woman who comes boldly to, to Jesus' side and says and demands that she have that blessing, not for herself, but for her beloved child. And she does insist, and he does relent and says, your faith has made her well. That location to, to risk to be there at the table is, is one path we could take, but I want us to travel this morning with the ancient prophet, with Isaiah. Let us travel together. Let us pray. Come now, God of grace and truth, through this your preached word, shatter and bind, correct and guide, challenge and love, 
that we may participate ever more faithfully in the building of your world, overflowing with justice and mercy. In the name of the one who holds the whole world in the palm of her hand, amen. So the text, let's locate it for just a moment. These, these essential pieces, I know I've chopped up 55 and the beginning of 61 a little bit, and they were read nicely this morning, thank you. Let me remind us of just this, this turn, this out of this incredible poem full of joy and hope and accommodation and insistence. Listen for the word of the Lord one more time. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return until they have watered the earth, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that for which I have purposed and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. It shall go out and it shall return, not empty, but full of that promise, that thing for which I sent it. Our location, brothers and sisters, doesn't have to be taken so literally. If you want the literal turn, we can find it in the woods a bit south of here. Don and Dorothy, Sumitra and I, when we're not on the road, all of us call, our, uh, call Macon home. And Macon sits right at the edge of a contiguous area, Bond Swamp and some national forest area. And if you, if you are to go just to the edge of downtown, you get right to that precipice where the bears and the alligators roam. Just a little, just a little wilder, just a little warmer. We had a bear wander up to one of our downtown buildings a few years ago. No one saw it except on a security camera re reviewed the next day. This is the land of many titles, one of which could be hunter's paradise. And so when there is a bear hunt, two gentlemen out, Jim and John, they're out in that bond swamp and they're hunting duck, but they realize all too late that a bear, a mother bear with two cubs has come up around behind them and Jim and John look at each other and John starts running. <laughs> and Jim throws his stuff down and starts following John and almost out of breath, the, the one behind says to, to Jim in the front, you can't outrun that bear. And John says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> location, <laughs> location, location. The proximity has everything to do there, doesn't it? When I drive up from Macon, I'm sometimes flying in from somewhere else and we'll, we'll come directly to church here if my schedule allows. And sometimes we're... Uh, grateful that the traffic's not much on Sunday morning coming up, but, but there are moments where I will be here and the service has started from the distance. And, and so I can see sometimes through the window of the door back here where the ushers gather and what's happening in, in the sanctuary and what that looks like from that vantage point. The proximity, the vantage point is different from there. It's different when you stand here in the pulpit, not only the weight of the word and that to be delivered, but what you see in front of you, the people who are gathered, the very children of God. Proximity in this text is, to put it briefly, that place of exile. This is what the prophet sees in front of him as he looks out. A people who have been cast out of their land and put into exile in Babylon. And they are within one year, we know, of finding that release. And who is it that gathers together the voice of God and encourages the people and creates a way out of no way? It is, the scholars tell us, this 
collaboration, this work of, of three prophets, Isaiah. And, and here we find this text, this poem, as beautifully written as anything else inside the Codex. This poem that says this beautiful, beautiful image sets before us this image of what is to come. This image of the kingdom that will be. The thorn no longer grows, but a flower in its place. The hills are no longer high and steep, but made low. You know the language, don't you? We know those rough places. We long and pray for that smooth path. It is as if we can see what's ahead, but need some encouragement and guidance about how to get there. And here, Isaiah, situated in this almost released people, this wandering people, suggests that indeed that place comes through God's word, that release, that promise, and the proximity brothers and sisters, to, to the people and God's word is palpable here. What does it mean to be so close to that which will make real this new kingdom? It is of great comfort to be sure, but it's also a challenge. It is, it is the notion that this word is with us always, but it is also going out in front of us. It's with us and we're chasing it. All at the same time. We know something about a world that's turned upside down, a people in exile. To locate the text in more contemporary terms, Dr. King knew something about this. We invoke his name a lot this time of year. At Ebenezer last week, or earlier this week on Monday, the rafters, you know, all the way to the rafters full. Pastor Warnock said, you know, it's well and good that we celebrate his name today, but will we do it tomorrow? He doesn't mean through the end of February, of course. Dr. King, if we were to mash together this prophetic voice from this 6th century prophet Isaiah and Dr. King's prophetic voice, it might sound something like this. The word that goes out from my mouth will go out with a purpose and it will not return until the ark has been bent towards justice forever and ever. That word goes out with purpose. We sit at Chautauqua, Dwight and I, in this strange, strange place, Alice going down that rabbit hole has nothing on us at Chautauqua. It is different. It is different. And I don't know if you were there, Dwight, the Sunday that Sharon Bruce preached. The first rabbi to be invited to lead this week-long Monday through Friday service. 3,000 seat amphitheater in and all of its storied history about as long as this congregation's history not one rabbi had been invited to deliver that set of sermons and so this was the time that Chautauqua took a risk this summer and said we'll invite her to be here and on the very first day that we opened the season Sharon Bruce pastor of Five, six thousand at a conservative synagogue in Los Angeles, the ICARC community. Check out her TED Talk. Um, what is it called? Revitalizing Religion, I believe. Sharon stands up and clearly something is weighing on her. And knowing how polished a speaker she is and what a prolific author and the ways in which she has prepared and prepared diligently, I can tell there is a weight on her that is beyond just the weight of that moment. And Chautauqua is a place where you can easily choose to gate out the balance of reality and the world around you. It's not hard to do. Very few televisions there. You have to subscribe to get the New York Times. 
um, the newspaper that's printed daily is only about news within the walls of Chautauqua. And that's well and good. There are times that we need that kind of escape. And I don't suggest that that ought to change necessarily, but Sharon stepped into the pulpit and threw something against that glass between us who were listening and her who was speaking a weight that she had to describe. She said, I did see the times. It's a regular thing for me, and I couldn't break that habit. And she said, I saw in the New York Times this late June day an image that I cannot get out of my mind. It was of a father and his infant daughter washed up on the southern shore of our country in the Rio Grande. I expect you remember not only that story, but the image. And as she described it, you get this pit in your stomach and a cold sweat and you know that it's something that we will have to live with, all of us. But there were no images. Chautauqua doesn't make it easy to project images on the spur of the moment. So it was just, just Sharon's words, just Rabbi Bruce's words describing this. And I knew at the end of the week, when I left Chautauqua, that image would find me. I didn't know where it would find me or how it would find me, but in today's world, I would have to work very, very hard and ultimately unsuccessfully to run from this image of this immigrating child of God who had drowned trying to get to a better life for his children. A horrific scene. And she described the colors his red shirt, red like blood. I left Chautauqua that week, and I needed to stop for gas somewhere in the middle of Ohio, and the sun is almost gone, and the receipt button wouldn't work at the pump, and so I needed to go inside to get my receipt for my travel records. And as I, I came around from the counter, having gotten my receipt, I glanced to the right at the newsstand and a flash of red. That New York Times Sunday piece was still on the top of the rack. And, and it was just a flash, but it was exactly what I knew it was, just from the red. And I turned around with some heaviness and bought the paper and put it on the driver's side next to me and traveled with it home, not reading as I drove, but knowing that I would ingest it later and that it would stay with me. It's that proximity that Sharon dared to bring to this idyllic place and throw that against our humanity and say, who the hell are we? Who are we to suggest that this child of God does not have place and standing? Proximity matters, sisters and brothers. It matters when I stand at the back here and peer through the window and see a mother three rows back in this very sanctuary less than a month ago. And because I was in the back looking in, I could see her with a young child, five, six years old, her son, I presumed. And they were coloring together, coloring through the sermon or through the anthem, I believe it was. I got in here before the sermon start, Pastor. I get credit, <laughs> get credit for being here that Sunday. The proximity matters because if that child is not in this sanctuary, the word of God has a much harder time grabbing hold. God bless parents who have their children here in worship. God bless a congregation that allows that. A little bit of rustling and a, a crying every now and then. That's the very voice of God. Proximity matters when you, when you sit here and you look up and you see Lynn Alston dancing during one of the jazz hymns 
But it's not just that she's dancing. She's dancing with a young man. Maybe her grandson. Probably not. Probably a beloved member of this congregation. And there was no way around. That was such a wide and deep moment. There was no way that young man went away from that moment not knowing he was loved. He knew it. I knew it. Where we're situated matters. It's not just about the sanctuary, though, is it? We spend an hour, two, three maybe, if we're on some committees, inside the walls of this church as lay people. And then, and then we go out into the world where we live the majority of our lives. Out there, it functions differently, doesn't it? It's easier to step over those who are hurting. It's easier to be overwhelmed with what needs doing. We hear this image of God's coming kingdom, how beautiful it is, what it will mean for the lion and the lamb to lay down together, for the thistle to be no more, for the high places made low. But how do we get there? How do we do that? How do we get from where we are now to, to that kingdom we are assured is coming? One group, more than any other that I've seen in my professional career, is about that business right now. I was just in Washington, D.C. this past week with a group of social workers. Any social workers in the house? God bless you. God bless you. Social work and the research arm, particularly of social work, decided about six years ago that the research they were doing to make the world better was not getting into practice. Stayed in the academy. Locked in. Couldn't get out. What shall we do? Shall we become less and less relevant in a world that needs us more and more? Or, or, said this group of social work researchers, will we risk reinventing ourselves in order to make what we do live? And they said yes. They called it the Grand Challenges. It was a page out of architecture and engineers and other professional groups that have, that have decided to to cast a new direction for their profession. And this group of social work researchers, by golly, uh, they don't gather more than 500 at a conference, but they've got the right people in the room, and they struggled and decided and wrestled and argued and came up with 12 grand challenges that are utterly redefining social work and the world we live in. These aren't, these aren't on the margin kind of things. These are things like reducing poverty by 20% in the United States in a decade. How do, you, how do you take that on? How do you pull that apart? How do you make that happen? It's things like reducing um, extreme inequality in the country. It's things like providing housing for veterans. It's things that they knew from the very beginning they could never accomplish on their own. It wasn't even plausible that they could go after these things by themselves. It insisted on a proximity and a place and a confession that the word that they sent out had to be accompanied with the actions of so many others in order to see that it comes back fulfilling its purpose. It's going to take elected officials. It's going to take social workers. It's going to take attorneys. It's going to take public school teachers. It's going to take pastors. It's going to take every facet of society to make any meaningful progress on something that large. But that was the idea. To risk being vulnerable, to risk partnering in new ways to ensure that this word, this good word, this life-giving word went out and did not come back empty. Amen. Oh, it's a grand challenge. And we were just together 
And now they are adding a 13th, this conversation around race in our country. The big question is, is, is race and justice part of each of those thir- 12? Or does it become a 13th and stand on its own? The answer they're coming to is both and. Yes, it needs its own place. And yes, it needs to impact everything from housing to public education to income equality. The way in which we risk has everything to do with this word of God and whether it will be situated in a place that can fulfill its purpose. To bring it home quite clearly, right here to this congregation, started over 150 years ago, what does it mean for us to take a look at the next half century? This next 50 years, what proximity, what neighborhood, what location do we want to find ourselves? Be assured that wherever we go, God's presence is with us. Take great comfort in knowing that. Where two or three are gathered, there is God in the midst. Take great comfort in knowing that God shall surely gather all creation back unto God's self. Not a hair lost. I believe in a God of love of that magnitude. But it is also challenging for us. On the heels of a divided nation, this congregation started just after the Civil War. We are at that point of being in a divided nation once again. And it is a pregnant and terrifying and potential laden world. And this congregation, first congregational, with all of its internal structure around valuing education, respecting all persons, loving the arts, having come through highs and lows, a firehouse three times reused for one good purpose after another after another, a building brought back to such glory that illuminates Abraham Lincoln on one side and the very angel of God above. This is not a retrofitted congregation that tries to squeeze in between buildings and universities and the history of someone else in this place. No, this is a unique place for a unique time. Dare we risk? Dare we risk going out with that word knowing that we cannot predict exactly where it will take us. One text pastor says, we'll be, Jesus says, you'll be taken where you do not want to go. You don't know what you're asking for. And yet we're bold enough to ask because we know that we are together. When Master Thomas walks back down the aisle and gathers this light of the world and carries it out before us, We know we are bound together as community, imperfect, but community, laced together with the very sinew of God's being that cannot be put asunder. Mm. Sharon Bruce calls it the tikkun olam, that Jewish concept meaning the repairing of the world. It is our task children of God, to do no less than that, to bring about the very kingdom of God. So let us do that. Let us go out in joy, be brought back in love, and let us pursue justice and mercy and love kindness. What else is required of us? Amen and amen.
We want to open the doors of the church and say that if you're looking for a church home, I don't think there could have been a better sermon as an invitation to you to live out your faith. First of all, we want to thank Reverend Cameron Pennybacker for that very, very fine message. Amen. Thinking about the proximity of place, I, I think that Cameron was brought into my life that we might be brought close to one another. Because sometimes when I get discouraged around some of these issues of social justice, and we are the white folk in the social justice struggle, then the Lord puts Cameron in my path to give me a sense of hope and possibility. He reminds me that we are all in this together. And what a great message. Don't send the word out and let it come back empty. The gospel group, the Williams brothers, would say, I'm too close, too close, too close to turn around now. So take his word seriously. And if this is your day to join us in fellowship, I invite you to come down and stand with me in this chancel, and we can take you into membership this very day. If you need to pray about it and speak with me about it, make an appointment and let's talk to get you involved in this important work of repairing the world. What a better image we couldn't ask for, repairing the world. Beloved, let's all stand and sing along with the choir and give somebody the gumption to maybe come down and stand with us. Come on. Let the church say amen. amen. Before we have the benediction and our service of silence, we want to thank not only the voices of faith, but our chancel choir for this wonderful, wonderful music and worship. We want to thank Renee Clark for her musicianship and Connie Dubois. And many of you maybe didn't notice, but we had a guest organist, but he was so terrific, we didn't even miss Brother Trey. Don't tell him I said that. But, Brother Justin, we appreciate your musicianship, both at the piano and at the organ. You've done a great job, and you didn't miss a beat, and we're grateful for you. Beloved, it's been a good day, and God has called us to do some important things in the world. That's why we come in the church, so that we can then, what, go back out into the world. So I thank you all for sharing this time with us. Thank you, Douglas, for playing that oboe so well. That's the, hard, that's the hardest instrument in the whole orchestra. And you got down. Thank you. We appreciate you. We're grateful for our new member, Reverend Cameron Pennybacker, because Cameron's going to help us to build this next chapter in our church. And we're going to literally look like the church we want to be. If we're going to be inclusive, if we're going to be diverse, then we got to look inclusive, right? The pulpit has to look inclusive. The choir has to look inc inclusive. The staff has to look inclusive. So we're building. We're building. And we're going to try to do that repair work. 
Let us now continue and close our service with our service of silence. Master Thomas is going to come out, take the light back out into the world, and then I'm going to ask Reverend Cameron to give us the benediction. Benediction, the, the moment of sending forth has two parts. One is a blessing and the other is a charge. And so I might ask us to stand in an ancient posture today as we get ready to leave. An orant stance. Try this. If you're able, feet shoulder width apart, firmly planted. Arms up, palms to the sky. Eyes tilted upward, that place from which God's word comes and falls upon us like a descending dove. And now the charge and the blessing. God, whose sheep are many and whose love is endless, enfold us, we pray. Go with us, hemming us in before and behind. Not just for our own safety and edification, but that we indeed might be your voice, your hands, your feet, your presence in the world, bending the ark towards justice. Amen. <laughs>